Welcome to In the Spotlight. I'm Abigail Pogrubin. Judith Rosenbaum is CEO of the Jewish Women's Archive, a pioneering digital archive that documents Jewish women's stories, elevates their voices, and inspires them to be agents of change. An educator, historian, and writer, Judith earned a PhD in American Studies from Brown University with a focus on women, gender, and social movements. A former Fulbright Fellow, she teaches and lectures widely on Jewish studies and women's studies and publishes in both academic and popular journals. She serves on the faculty of the Bronfman Fellowship and is a Schusterman Senior Fellow. Judith lives with her family in the Boston area, and I'm talking to her virtually. I wish we could be together, Judith, but welcome to the broadcast. Thank you so much. I'm really glad to be here. It's great to see you. So I want to make sure that everyone listening, before we get to your story, understands the JWA story, the Jewish Women's Archive. It astonishes me, as important as it is, as game-changing as it is, how many people don't actually know what JWA does. Um, so can you at, at least maybe just encapsulate its founding and kind of its mandate? Yeah, absolutely. So JWA was founded about 26 years ago in the early days of the internet, really sort of presciently taking advantage of what the internet would have to offer to change how we understand history and to change how we understand archives. The founders of JWA saw that there was this void in the historical record that history really had been written from the perspective of men um, and that the really important roles that Jewish women had played forever in their communities hadn't been acknowledged. And because of that, the value of Jewish women to the world hadn't been acknowledged. And people of all genders missed out on having role models um, and missed out on really being able to understand the capacity of women and girls. Um, so our work was really started first to try to make the knowledge that was available accessible to people all around the world and to change that idea of the archive, right? We, you know, I'm a historian, so I love archives, but I also recognize they're mo not, you know, the friendliest or sexiest of places, right? We tend to think of them as being sort of dusty, dry, inaccessible. And I, I remember the days of microfiche. I don't even know if anyone <laughs> listening remembers that. Yes, exactly. Um and, you know, and so people, I think, often think of history as something that, you know, might be interesting, but is kind of dry, not really relevant to our daily lives and something that's kind of the realm of scholars. And JWA was really founded with this vision of democratizing history and saying, no, history belongs to everyone. And it actually has a really big role, plays a really big role in how we understand the world, how we understand ourselves, how we understand what's possible to do. You know, history is a the study of change over time. So if you're interested in how change is made, you have to understand history. And, and um, before so you continue, like, Judith, was was yeah. the founders, was there resistance to doing this? Was there were, were there folks who said, this is one of those feminist ideas that isn't necessary or is kind of an overcorrection? Was there that kind of, of pushback? I think there was, there certainly was a pushback of just sort of, you know, the defensiveness in general of being like, no, the history we have is probably right. Like, I don't know those stories, so they must not exist. Um, and a sense that um, there just wasn't so much of a need or that it wasn't going to be interesting. And also people didn't understand what a digital archive would be, right? So I think there was a lot of sense of like, what are you talking about? Like, what would that even be? Um, but, you know, the founders were really, the, the founders, I should say, were Gail torsky Reamer and with the... Um, founding chair Barbara Dopkin, really had a vision of a different kind of way to change culture. I mean, JWA is ultimately a project that's about culture change, about, um, you know, restoring the voices of women and girls to our story. And by doing that, not just adding them, but actually transforming the whole way we understand not just the past, but also the world we live in and what's possible for the future. And and before you explain exactly how it works, I just actually, I don't usually quote my mom, but I, I saw that you you quoted her um, in, in a Zoom event that you did, and, and I thought it was worth sharing. Um, for those who don't know, my mother is Letty Cotton Pogrebin, who co-founded Ms. Magazine with Gloria Steinem and four others. Um, and my mom said about JWA, for a people whose ethos whose very identity is founded in remembering, we have forgotten too much about Jewish women. For a community that calls itself the people of the book, we have left too many pages blank. I wanna let you respond to that, but I think what she's really kind of harnessing is the Jewish charge of memory, of history, of 
looking back and keeping track and how women were so missing from those stories, even though they were there in, in such important ways. Absolutely. And I quote your mother's words all the time because I think it's such a perfect encapsulation of what JWA's work is all about. You know, the sense that as Jews, we supposedly value history and heritage a lot, but we're actually telling a very, very narrow slice of it. And so by doing that, we're we're really losing an enormous part of our history and heritage and the richness of it, the diversity of it. Um, and so we have a kind of Jewish commitment to telling a fuller story and being able to honor um, the just the incredible range of people who have made up the Jewish story through the ages. And I should say that once someone starts taking the dive, it's just extraordinary what you've amassed and the stories are. Each one of them is kind of a movie unto itself, unto herself. Um, can you just explain how the digital archive works and then what else JWA does in terms of making some of these stories accessible? Yeah, absolutely. And I'll, and I'll also say one other thing related to your mom is that one of the stories that I know she's told about the founding of Ms. Magazine, I think, relates to the question you were asking about kind of the response to JWA in the early years. When Ms. was founded, there is the sense that, oh, great, you'll put out one issue and then you'll be done because there won't be anything else left to say. And I think there was probably some of that same response to JWA, like, OK, so you'll amass a few stories and have a nice little website and that'll be great. And actually, we have tens of thousands of stories on our site. We are used by more than three million people around the world of all backgrounds, all wow. genders um, from more than 230 countries, according to Google each year. Um, and we're adding all the time. So. Um, the main part of our archive is our website, jwa.org. And like you said, it's very easy to get lost there. People often call me and they say, oh, my God, I went to look up one thing on your site and three hours passed. I lost my whole afternoon, but I found out all these things I never knew. Um, so that's kind of the core of our archive. And and that's that's the kind of basic level of material, which is JWA as a resource, right, a resource to inform. So. That includes our Encyclopedia of Jewish Women. Uh, we have all kinds of curricula, all kinds of online exhibits and materials. Um, and as I said, that's used by millions of people around the world every year. And, and, and who's generating the content? Are, do you have researchers, historians? Or is it coming from a, uh, a number of places? It comes from a number of places. It depends on the project. So our encyclopedia is generated by scholars, um, but some of the material is generated by our staff. There are other projects that we do in partnership with lots of organizations. Um, so it kind of depends on the project where, where the materials come from. We have a very active blog. Um, and I think part of what is exciting to me about JWA as, a, as you know, the, the breadth of our resources is that it introduces people from so many different backgrounds to just a much richer, diverse, more nuanced Jewish story. So for some people, that means it's an entry point for Jews who may have been on the margins and didn't see themselves reflected and represented in Jewish stories. In some cases, it's people who, you know, like I think about this when I look at our websites and I see, oh, you know, who are the people in Kyrgyzstan who are using our site, right? And that is people who are learning about Jewish history. And for the first time ever in history, they're able to do that through the stories of Jewish women, which is really kind of revolutionary and gives a whole different perspective on on what the you know, what Jewish history has been. Um, so that's one level of our work. Another level is our programs, which are really meant to engage people in meaningful, substantive conversations about Jewishness and gender and to shape the kinds of conversations that are happening in, you know, in the world uh, and in institutions, both within and outside of the Jewish community. So some of that work happens through things like our podcast, our blog, our social media, um, our virtual programs, which have been almost weekly and very popular since the beginning of, of uh, COVID. They're fantastic. Yeah. And you can see all those. If you go to the website, all of this is available. You see how to get to the podcast, how to get to those conversations. Am I right about that? Yes, and you can find podcasts at any, as they say it anywhere you get your podcasts, and um, and our uh, most of our online programs are available on our site and on YouTube, so you can find them there. And and, um, and just to, just so I back up a little bit as to how you got so involved, because I it was well, there's one other piece of our work that I just sure. want to mention. Is that okay? Um, the last piece of our work, which is the kind of the newest piece, is um, is the the training that we offer, and that is 
our work to empower women and girls and train a new generation of Jewish women to see themselves as leaders and history makers in their communities. Um, and our Rising Voices Fellowship, which is our teen leadership program, which now has almost 150 um, graduates who are, they start in high school and then, you know, the graduates now go through college and beyond. And we're really, you know, teaching them and giving them skills to take on leadership in their communities and to understand themselves as history makers. So that's been a really fun and exciting part of our work. And and also one of the things that teaches me the most as I learn from our younger leaders. So so let's talk about you for a minute and how you came to JWA. Was was this something that, that where they found you or did you know this existed and want to be part of it? So it was a very happy accident, although I will say I also have a pioneering Jewish feminist mom. Um, so it's not maybe that much of an accident that I ended up where, tell where the, I Tell the viewers who she is. My mom was Paula Hyman, um, who was a Jewish historian and a Jewish, an early Jewish feminist. Um, and so I definitely come to this work very honestly. <laughs> I grew up with- She was with pretty Jewish seismic. She was pretty influential. Definitely. She kind of helped create the field. And so this was, you know, the kind of conversations that I have at work now are the kinds of things that were happening at my kitchen table growing up. Um, and I think that very much influenced where I ended up, not just in terms of my own love of history, but, you know, I was really unusually for someone born in the early 70s. I grew up with a sense that the Jewish community was a feminist, you know, that Judaism was feminist and that full participation in the Jewish community was my birthright. And as I grew up and, you know, kind of entered into the world, I discovered that that was not the perspective that was shared by the vast majority of people I encountered. And so there was this kind of gap of trying to understand, like, how is it that this thing that I was given as my inheritance is actually not very well known? And how is it that um, the story that I encounter about the Jewish world is very different from the one that I perceived in my house and in my community. And how do I, that, that gave me a sense of wanting to change that. And, and then I also grew up with a sense that history was a tool for social change and, um, and that you could use history to change the way people understand themselves and to make change in the world, that it was really an, an activist kind of, uh, project. And so I went to grad school in uh, women's history, basically in American studies. And I really loved what I was studying. I was studying women and activism. And it started to feel really weird to be doing that alone in a library. <laughs> and I and I and it felt weird to be, you know, engaging in really interesting conversations, but with like five other people who really cared about them. And I was really interested in this piece of like, okay, well, what does this matter for the world? Like, why would someone else care about this other than the very rarefied group of scholars that I was working with? Um, and so I started pretty early in grad school to think, okay, well, maybe the traditional academic path is not going to be the one for me. And I wanted to find places that would bring together my commitments to history, but also to Jewish community and to feminism and to activism. And I was very lucky to find that in the very early years of the archive through a meeting on the street and a conversation on the street. Um, and I I came to JWA as, as a graduate intern in the summer of 2000 and then basically kept making up projects that they should hire me to do until I was finished with my PhD and was hired as a full-time staff member. So I always say to our interns um, when I meet them and, and do a kind of introduction to JWA that they too someday could be the CEO of the whole shebang. That's great. You mentioned feminism, and we know that that word, unfortunately, has become freighted and, and, and controversial, which I, you know, I find exhausting and absurd. But, but you, you know kind of the attachments that are put on it. And when you, do you shy away from saying that JWA is a feminist organization? And how do you kind of manage the assumptions around that? So I definitely don't shy away from using the word feminism because I think that part of our work is really about educating people to the breadth and nuances of what feminism can be. People, of course, have very fixed notions. And, and those fixed notions, by the way, can be a whole range of different things. And I've been in, at this work long enough to see how that's changed over time. Um, but I think what has stayed consistent is our sense that we want people to understand that feminism is not one thing um, and that it actually has a very deep and diverse history that is often flattened in the way it's portrayed in the media and that Jewish women have a place in it, have a place in it historically, which is interesting to explore, mm -hmm. but also that we have a place in it today, not just as, you know, kind of white feminists, that is, is often assumed, but as a, as a 
a intersectional presence, right? There are Jews of all colors, there are Jews of all backgrounds. And I think Jewishness itself is so complex that it becomes a way, I think, of um, broadening conversations about what intersectionality should be. And particularly in this moment where, you know, we see increasing anti-Semitism, anti-Semitism, we see increasing attacks on women's rights. I think it's really important that we be having these conversations that look at our world through both a gender lens and a Jewish lens and don't try to separate those things. So when you talk about the marriage, maybe marriage is the wrong word, of feminism and Judaism, and you look at sort of the arc of history, how do you explain maybe to people who are new to it how that, that intersection of the two is playing out? So I think historically, one of the things that's really interesting to look at is how the roles that Jewish women have played in feminism for many, many decades, um, which is not dissimilar to the roles that Jewish women have played in most social movements, right? And that's a way of understanding how um, the experience of Jewishness has provided a lens for understanding lots of different kinds of oppression and discrimination and marginalization. And, you know, as we know, people on the margins have a lot of insight into what's broken in the world and how to change it. Um, and I think that Jewish women have brought a complex view of that to the table from the beginning. That hasn't always been the way it's been told, but I think that there is that complexity there and we can learn a lot from that today as well. Um, one of the things that we see now with, for example, our Rising Voices fellows, our teen fellows, is how hard it is for some of them who are very committed to feminism to show up as Jews in feminist communities or to or in communities on the left, and that they need places where they can explore Jewishness and feminism um, together, that they don't want those things to have to be compartmentalized. They don't want to have to bifurcate their identity. And part of what feminism and Jewish feminism has always been about is being able to show up as your full self and to bring your full self to the table and be honest about who you are and to explore, you know, have the space to explore that. And so I'm really proud that JWA gives um, young women a place to do that and also gives them a sense that there is an incredible legacy of activism and commitment to social justice that they inherit as Jewish women. And you mentioned the, the rise in anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism, I would add. Um, just how, how does JWA think about this particular moment? Is that something that you are actually thinking strategically about? Is, is there some kind of response you think JWA can uniquely have um, to what is making everyone feel like, should we be more alarmed? I mean, we are alarmed. Should we be more alarmed? You know, are we living through something uh, portentous. So I have found in these last <laughs> several tumultuous years to find, I, I found our work to be very grounding. I find working in the realm of history to be really helpful because it gives just gives us a broader perspective and gives us a sense of the vast resources that we have to draw on the, the resources of history, right? The lessons of history, both the things that have worked and the things that haven't worked. So I always think that, um, we have something to say in a couple of different ways. One is by looking historically and understanding this moment in a larger context. And um, sometimes that can be scary, but it also, I think, can be um, it can be grounding. As I said, I think it can it can help us understand like, OK, we're not the first people to face some of these questions. We can learn from the past. Um, we have a lot of strength and resilience, and we know that revisiting stories of challenging times is a source of resilience for people psychologically. So there's that piece of it as well. Um, I think also one of the things that JWA offers and why we, why I feel like our work is so crucial in this moment is, you know, this is a, this is a moment that lacks nuance. I think, unfortunately, I think, you know, social media has a lot of wonderful things to offer, but it is not a place of much nuance. Complexity. Um, yeah. Yeah. Th there's not much room for complexity. And, I think what JWA does, so one of the things we do so well is to offer opportunities for nuanced conversation and to say, okay, let's let's get out of this particular moment. Let's look at the broader context. Let's look at things historically. Let's, let's open up those kinds of conversations and bring in different perspectives. That's part of what having a more diverse uh, historical record allows us to do. It, it keeps, it 
it kind of offers a bulwark against flattening the narrative. That's what our work is all about. Um, and that's, I think, very much what's needed in this moment. And when you look at, I mean, you, I'm sure you've read as much as you can absorb of, of what you offer in terms of, of portraits and stories, but can you single out even just a couple of people who are not necessarily the Emma Goldmans and the Ruth Bader Ginsburgs, um, people who you, women who you think some of us have missed that JWA highlights in a, in a way that's really refreshing and educating. Yes. Oh my gosh. Well, here here's where it, it's very hard to limit. But I can name just I'll try to name a few off the top of my head that you know. Great. That I've been coming back to in the last few days. So one is um, Osnat Barzani, who was a Rosh Yeshiva, the head of a yeshiva in 17th century Kurdistan. Now that is not something most people have heard, um, and I think it challenges a lot of what we think we know about women's roles during that time and women's ro women's roles in religious spaces until the modern period right um and it you know this this year this past year we were celebrating 50 years of women in the rabbinate in america but then you look at somebody like osnat barzani and it throws all of that into question like okay if there were women who were doing these things in the 17th century why do we not know that and and how would have knowing that changed our whole sense of what women could do. So that's one that like, right. you know, kind of blew my mind when I first learned about her um, at JWA. Um, who else? Uh, one of my colleagues who was a basketball player always talks about Senda Berenson, who was the founder of women's basketball. I don't think most people assume that a Jew was involved in that, but it's great for the sports lovers among us. Um, I really enjoyed learning about Sarah Rodriguez Brandon, who was a multiracial Jew um, in the late 18th, early 19th century, born in Barbados to an enslaved mother and a free Jewish man um, who purchased her and freed her brother. And she went on to become one of the um, very much part of the Jewish community in Suriname and then in London and then in New York. And um, unfortunately, died very young in childbirth, as many mm women did at the time. But again, knowing that there was a Jew of color who was a prominent member of the Jewish community at that time in this kind of global Jewish world, I think challenges a lot of our assumptions. Um, I was reading recently about Bidi Serrata Gordon, who worked in Japan as a translator and helped negotiate the Japanese constitution in 1946 and added in language about women's rights to the Japanese con constitution. So there are all these kind of both, you know, public leadership roles and sort of through the back door kinds of leadership roles. And you mentioned Emma Goldman, and I will say, yes, she is one of our better known people on the site. But what I will say about even covering someone like Emma Goldman is there are a lot of people who celebrate her as, you know, a kind of radical and assume that she kind of rejected her Jewishness because of the, you know, kind of her, uh, anarchist ideology. But the truth is, she did a lot of lecturing in Yiddish. She compared herself in her memoir to the biblical figure of Judith. I think looking at her through a Jewish lens also gives us a different perspective on uh, on politics, on, you know, women's global activism. And so it's fun to be able to re-engage with her in this context as well. And you've and you've mentioned more than once uh, women rabbis, which obviously is is, you know, within our lifetime, which is kind of incredible that we now take it for granted. I, my rabbi is Rabbi Angela Bookdahl, whom I know you've interviewed and featured on JWA. But yes, uh, how do you see different. just, these, this isn't just history, this is ritual changing, liturgy changing, um, Jewish engagement changing. Like where do you see history actually affecting um, Judaism observance? Yeah, I mean, that's one of the things, the, the example of women rabbis is such a great example of why it matters for women to be included, because we see that when you when you have women as rabbis, it's not just that, OK, now there's a woman on the Bima leading services. It changes every aspect of Judaism because they bring their perspective and their life experience. And that leads to new interpretations of the Torah, new ritual, new understandings of community, new understandings of what even the rabbinic role is and a desire to reclaim different kinds of practices and different kinds of, you know, for mothers. So it changes everything. And I think that that's just a, a microcosm of what happens when you include women both in roles publicly, but also even just in the story of history. It just it it doesn't just add to the story. It actually changes the whole the whole thing. 
Judith Rosenbaum, thank you for all you do. And I hope everyone will go to the site. It's jwa.org, am I right? jwa.org, right. you will see Judith there, all her partners and incredible stories about incredible women that will inspire and teach you. I'm Abigail Pogrebin, so good to be with you for In the Spotlight. See you next time. Mm -hmm.